Ambassador, can you speak something? Sir, good uh, evening to Dindigal yeah. and to Delhi. Yeah, we are on. We are on. Okay, sir. Amba we are on. Ambassador, correct. Hmm? Ambassador, correct. Ambassador is there. Yeah. He is right. Yeah. 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 Now, now is ready. Ready? Now is ready. I think so. Yes. Yes. Yes, professor. It's ready. Can you start? Yes, sir. Yes, professor. Very good evening, to everyone, for joining five-day webinar series from GRI Center of Gandhigram Rural Institute, deemed to be university. In these five days, we are going to touch various subjects with various experts from across and I am sure this session will enrich the audience, the faculty and the student fraternity of Gandhigram and whoever is there in line with us. Thank you so much for all for joining. I request our Vice Chancellor in charge to bless this first day event to go live. Over to you, Professor. <coughs> Professor. Good evening to all. Good evening to all. Revered Chancellor of our esteemed institution, respected Registrar, Landed Chief Guest, Mr. K.P. Fabian Ambassador, who wishes to share his knowledge on foreign policy in the changing geopolitical context, and a learned resource persons, Sri Sanjay Kumar Shinha, IFS, Joint Secretary, Ministry of HRD, Government of India, Dr. K. Rajalingam, MD, Matrika Hospital for Women and Children, Raziabat, Dr. Aglis Kumar Verma, Professor, Department of Chemistry, the University, and Dr. V. Nagajodi, Principal Sri Shatra Prabhu Jain College, Binjur, Chennai, and my dear participants and viewers across the globe. Indeed, it gives me great pleasure to speak to you today in this excellent occasion by inaugurating the webinar. And thanks to Dr. S. P. Krishna Kumar and his team who is looking after our GRE Center in New Delhi for organizing this work. program. Being governed and Nadu was founded by our beloved Dr. G. Ramachandran. We call him as Mama and Dr. T. S. Saundaram Ramachandran, Amma, who were direct disciples of our father of the nation, Mahatma Gandhi. Inspired by the features of rural development education models of Mahatma Gandhiji at the Sevagram, particular rural construction program, and the experiment of Rabbi Chagur at Sriniketan, they carved up the GRA, Gandhi Gram Rural Institute, in the year 1946 with the mission and objective of addressing the issues pertaining to rural development through teaching, research, and extension. The institute has got deep ministry status in the year 1976, and it, is, it has grown today as one amongst the national premier institute of higher education with a thrust on rural development. It has, as of now, eight schools comprising 60 departments, 12 centers, and offers 26 PG programs, including post-diploma programs, 12 UG programs, nine professional programs, and 12 skill-based programs through formal mode, besides the MPhil and the PhD, each one specializing on agriculture, animal husbandry, health and rural sanitation, cottage and small-scale industries, village governance, cooperatives, education, lifelong learning and adult and country education, food and nutrition, rural development, Gandhian thought, appropriate technology and rural habitat housing, green energy, 
humanities, culture, rural arts and literature and the, and the like. In this way, our university is unique from its products. It is not offering any conventional programs as done by others. Over the years, the institute has brought a significant level of socio-economic, cultural and, a, and a behavioral impact among rural communities, particularly in its cluster of adopted villages, and it has brought policy implications at the state and the national levels. It has been serving as knowledge supporting center for rural communities and the planners and the policy makers at large. I am very happy that our GRI center at New Delhi has been functioning very effectively as a knowledge hub by procuring and disseminating the expertise and the knowledge of eminent personalities for the benefit of our students and faculties. I congratulate and appreciate the efforts of Dr. Krishna Kumar and his team for organizing this wonderful webinar. Once again, I welcome all and the chief guests and all the resource persons for their earnest consent and the participation in the program. I wish all the viewers of this program and wish the program a great success. Jai Hind. Thank you, Professor. It was very nice uh, having you in this session of the webinar beginning. Um, we are really thankful for the uh, great words and uh, we will continue, we assure we will continue to do the best whatever we can from our end to Mother GRA. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you so much.
the next level. Uh, let me introduce uh, Ambassador K.P. Fabian. Uh, ambassadors have, have uh, served in the Indian Foreign Services from 1964 to 2000. He has served as ambassador to Finland, Qatar and Italy from where he has retired. In Rome, he was also permanent representative to FAO and other UN organizations in Rome. As Joint Secretary Gulf, Ambassador Fabian uh, was a key person in coordinating for the evictions from uh, evacuation from Kuwait and the Iraq following the occupation of Kuwait by then President Saddam Hussein in August 1990. After retirement, uh, Ambassador Fabian has served uh, on the board of directors of Syndicate Bank and RCF, that is Rastri Fertilizers and Chemicals. In NGO sector, he was president of IGSSS, Indo Global Social Service Society, and AFPRO, Action for Food Program. Ambassador Fabian has held uh, the KPS Manon Chair at Mahatma Gandhi University, Kotem. He was also a visiting professor in JNU. Currently, Ambassador uh, Fabian is a professor at Indian Society of International Law, New Delhi, and a distinguished fellow of Symbiosis University, Pune. Ambassador Fabian comments regularly on current affairs and his podcasts are on Google if you search Ambassador Fabian podcasts. Thank you. Over to Ambassador Fabian. Welcome you for this webinar. Thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, we are able to hear. Okay. Well, uh, Vice Chancellor uh, Dr. Uh, Subaraj, Registrar Dr. Shivakumar, Dr. Krishna Kumar, convener of the webinar series, uh, distinguished faculty distinguished uh, resource persons and uh, distinguished scholars and distinguished alumni across the globe. Uh, thank you, Dr. Krishna Kumar, for um, that very cordial introduction, which has certainly demonstrated mathematically that I am the youngest person around. Well, uh, Vice Chancellor, uh, Dr. Suburaj, Registrar Dr. Shivakumar, Dr. Krishna Kumar, convener of the webinar series, uh, distinguished faculty, distinguished uh, resource person. Uh, it's there, I mean, you know, I heard my own voice after a while so should i just carry on yeah, please carry on please carry on okay all right <laughs> uh, i was just waiting for that now, it's a high privilege and rare honor to be invited and to be, be able to exchange uh, ideas with you all of you um i don't come to you as a resource person i want to have a conversation in fact, what we need is, uh, you know, what uh, in ancient Greece, they had a symposium, exchange of ideas. Uh, thank you also. Thank you, Dr. Krishnakumar, also for sending me the handbook uh, compiled by you um, on the university. And uh, I noticed that uh, Mahatma Gandhi had visited uh, Madurai in... Uh, October 1946. Well, when I read, uh, I know I visited your uh, uh, university online. When I saw the vision and mission, I was reminded of uh, 
Mahatma Gandhi's address to the Asian Relations Conference, which Jawaharlal Nehru, not yet the Prime Minister of India, because this happened in March, April 1947, uh, much before, months before India became independent. But this Asian Relations Conference uh, had uh, delegates from all over Asia and also Egypt and other countries. So on the closing day, uh, Mahatma Gandhi addressed the delegates for the second time. And then he said, if you want to see real India, you should go out of Delhi and go to the villages. Now, what he said then was true, and it is still true now, because it is the rural India that is the real India, in the sense that uh, uh, not only it is a case that the majority of the population is in rural India, but the rural India provides uh, the food for rural India and urban India. Now, we are meeting at uh, six thirty or about in Delhi and uh, in India, and it is all right to say good evening to each other. But uh, Dr. Shiv Kumar was telling me that uh, there are uh, the alumni listening to us uh, across the globe. Obviously, we can't say good evening to somebody who is in New York. We will have to say good morning, I suppose. Now, this present dilemma which uh, we are experiencing reminds me of uh, a Buddhist monk who visited Finland when I was there in the last millennium in the 1980s. And that visit was, uh, you know, during the summer when in the northern part of Finland where we were, we had 720 hours of uninterrupted sunshine. And the monk was asked to propose a toast and he said, I can't say good morning. The sun, is, sun has been there for so many hours. I can't say good afternoon or good evening because the sun is going to be there for many more hours. And he paused and he said, I can only say it is so good, so good to be here and to be with all of you. Now that is what I can say truly. It is so good to be now, uh, to be with all of you across the globe. Awesome. Now, awesome. you know, awesome. I have, uh, uh, your reputation of the deemed university had reached me much before the invitation came through Dr. Shiv Kumar. Uh, and uh, since I have now visited you virtually, and learned more about what you are doing from the vice chancellor. I think uh, I am going to come and study there in my next life. That is great. Great. <laughs> and uh, great. you students, scholars who are there, you are really truly privileged. My congratulations to you. Now, foreign policy and diplomacy might, I repeat, might appear to some people in a rural setting uh, as something not of uh, immediate uh, concern. Well, that will be a wrong impression because what others do affect us and what we do affect others too. We are in a truly interdependent world. As we know, tsunamis, pollution, locusts, terrorism, viruses do not respect political boundaries. Take the case of COVID-19. 14 million infected, more than 600,000, you know, that's a grim death toll. Now, if China had acted responsibly, the pneumonia cases 
could have been contained before it became uh, a, an epidemic first and later a pandemic. Let's spend a few seconds on this. Uh, in mid-December 2019, cases of pneumonia of unknown origin were detected in Wuhan and a young doctor, Dr. Wen Liang Li, he went to the social media and raised the alarm. Then what happened? The all-powerful mayor of Wuhan, he was uh, scandalized. He was uh, mad with anger uh, at the young doctor. He rebuked him and silenced him. And uh, as a matter of fact, this poor doctor caught uh, the disease and uh, first week of February, he died. Now, why did the mayor do that? Because he had planned a big do, five day long big do, ending with uh, a huge banquet for 40,000 families. I repeat, 40,000 families on the 18th of January. So what happened? The banquet took place and the virus went viral. Beijing woke up, they sent a virologist, and by the 22nd of uh, January, Wuhan and the Hubei province were put under lockdown. Okay. Now, to go back in time, 31st of December, China informed the World Health Organization that there were cases of pneumonia. They did not know the origin thereof, but then China added a few significant words. Significant but convoluted. No evidence so far of human to human transmission. And WHO, without displaying much scientific temper. Now, that phrase was coined by Jawaharlal Nehru sometime in 1946. The WHO followed what China said, hook, line, and sinker. Instead, WHO should have asked searching, searching questions to China. What do you mean by saying no evidence so far? Is it not something which we have to dig deeper into? That's point number one. Point number two, WHO should have immediately intimated to all the member states, look, this is what China has told us, but we are not sure about it. This is something we are worried about. So let us put together a team of scientists. You all know about, we all know about uh, centers of disease control uh, and prevention. Now, we have it in India. There is one in the United States, very famous one, and in many other countries. The WHO should have put together a team of scientists who should have gone to China and investigated the matter thoroughly. Now, that's where WHO failed. Failure number one. Then, WHO was sitting on it, in fact, outsnailing out the snail. So slowly did it move. And it was only by the 11th of March that WHO declared a pandemic, by which time 4,291 deaths had occurred. And 114 countries had got the infection. And there were 118,000 infections. Now, let me, let's ask a question. Is there any, ro any rule in WHO which says that a pandemic can be declared only after 40, more than 4,000 people have died? So, that was irresponsible on the part of WHO, and we have established that China, too, was irresponsible. Now, I'm not suggesting that only these two are, have been irresponsible. There have been others too. In fact, I would say that with a few honorable exceptions, COVID-19 came to the world in 2020 
led by leaders, I repeat, with a few exceptions, honorable exceptions, leaders who lack a 2020 vision. So that's the lesson that we have to keep in mind. Now, I just want to make a distinction between foreign policy and diplomacy. Foreign policy is the broad framework within which we conduct our diplomacy. Why do I say the broad framework? Because, you know, we should know where we are geopolitically, geoeconomically, and otherwise now, say in 2020. And we should have a goal where we want to be by, say, 2025 or 2030. And how do we get there? We should have a reasonably clear uh, roadmap. Of course, it needs adjustment because, you know, diplomacy is uh, sort of a chess board, but always there are more than two people playing the game. You know, it's a chess board played by multiple players at the same time. I will expand on this later. Um, now, that broad framework is necessary for foreign policy. Let me raise the question. Do we have any clear idea of what should be our relations with Pakistan in 2025? Do we want to have uh, uh, good neighborly relations? Or do we want to see Pakistan dismantled? Or what do we want? We have to be clear. I'm not suggesting that, uh, you know, uh, as we uh, go along, we may have to change even our goal. But the point is, we should have a goal. Otherwise, we don't reach anywhere. Now comes the question. How do nations behave? Can we trust all of the nations in the world at all time? Maybe we cannot. Take the case of China. Now, in uh, take the case of 1962 war. There is a myth, and we are going to demolish a couple of them. That myth is that uh, the war occurred, or China retaliated and invaded India because of Jawaharlal Nehru's forward policy. Well, that is a simplification of history. The war occurred mainly because in 1959, Dalai Lama came to India and Jawaharlal Nehru correctly gave him, granted him asylum. While Mao Zedong had wanted that Nehru would send back the Dalai Lama to Tibet. And Mao Zedong had then decided to teach Nehru a lesson. He had told uh, the Chinese media, government controlled Chinese media, to attack Nehru. And uh, in fact, in some cases, they used to write something in a draft form and seek Mao's approval. And he always sharpen the attack. So that is about 1962. Now, let me sort of go back in time and demolish another myth. And that is that India's foreign policy came out of Nehru's head, you know, fully formed and fully armed, like uh, uh, Athena Pallas came out of the head of Zeus in Greek mythology. As a matter of fact, Nehru never claimed that. Eh? As a matter of fact, it was Mahatma Gandhi who spoke on foreign policy for the first time in India's history publicly. In 1919, 1920, he started the Khilafat movement. Now that was questioning United Kingdom's foreign policy. Then he also said in so many words, in plain English, the policy of the British government of India does not reflect the wishes of the people of India. And he publicly asked the young men in the Indian army, please do not go to Mesopotamia. Well, that was, you know, what Iraq was called at that time. 
do not go to Mesopotamia and uh, fight for the for British imperialism, which is trying to put down the struggle for independence of the brave people in Mesopotamia. So that is what you know we should keep in mind. Now let's move on. Uh, Nehru was it wrong in 1962 in not uh, assessing correctly China's intentions and capabilities? That was a serious mistake and we paid for it. Now, let's look at Nehru's daughter, Indira Gandhi. I would say that uh, Indira Gandhi was not only Nehru's daughter, but also Chanakya's granddaughter. In 1971, East Pakistan was undergoing terrible things. There was a military dictatorship there and thousands of people were being killed and hundreds of thousands of people from East Pakistan, soon to be Bangladesh, and East Pakistan were coming over to India. At that time, I was in uh, Vienna. I remember very well. I had uh, sort of uh, inspired some young Viennese to go and stage a dharna in front of the railway station. And then you know what happened? I get a phone call from the American counselor saying that, uh, Mr. Fabian, I was first secretary then, what have you done? So I said, please tell me what have I done? My daughter is sitting in front of the railway station and you have done it. So I said, please, I mean, uh, I have not asked anyone to go to the railway station, but I have been in touch with the young uh, people in uh, Vienna and uh, have been briefing them on what is happening. In, uh, in the Indian subcontinent. And if they decided to go and have a demonstration <laughs> in front of the railway station, well, and if your daughter is there, my compliments to her. Anyway, we kept good relations even after that. <laughs> okay, now, Indira Gandhi surveyed the geopolitical situation. There was an axis, strong axis between Pakistan, China, and the United States. Don't forget, United States did not have diplomatic relations with, with uh, uh, China at that time. Kissinger had come uh, in the summer to India, and then he went to Pakistan, and then it was uh, reported that he was uh, not keeping well, the so-called diplomatic illness. And he went to China and had his meetings with uh, Chuan Lai and Mao Zedong. Incidentally, at that meeting, the Chinese told Kissinger to tell the Pakistanis, because he was going to go back to Pakistan, listen, we know of uh, your problems with India, but we are with you. That was the message which uh, China gave to Pakistan through Kissinger during his first visit. Now, before his second visit, Indira Gandhi had signed the treaty with the Soviet Union, 9th of August. And when Kissinger went this time to China, the Chinese did not repeat that message to Pakistan. In other words, the Chinese also made their geopolitical calculations. If the USSR is with India, well, that makes it less um, uh, easy for China to support Pakistan militarily. You know, that is why the report, uh, the, the message was not re repeated. <laughs> now, to go back again to 1962, at some point of time, Nehru wrote to Kennedy asking for help, military help. That was the right thing to do. Some scholars said, how can you ask for military help when you are non-aligned. Listen, you know, first of all, to be non-aligned, you have to be alive. <laughs> you have to keep, you, you have to save your country. And another thing is that non-alignment is a means. It is not an end in itself. It is a means to, uh, to maintain your independence and to take care of your interests. So, but 
again, Nehru was right in seeking the help, but he was wrong in taking, some, in taking such a delay in seeking that help. He should have asked for that help on day one or hour one. Now, we have a, a little problem with China at the border. Let's look at it historically. In 1993, when P. V. Narsim Rao was our Prime Minister, he went to Beijing and he signed an agreement on maintaining peace and tranquility along the LAC line of actual control. Well, that was a good agreement, but there was a radical flow with that agreement because there was no attached map which showed the LAC lines because you know satellite imagery was there at that time and it was te technically possible to get maps and ask China okay you draw your LAC and we draw our LAC and we all sign this, uh, that this is what we have agreed upon that is how an international agreement is done not on the basis of a vague concept of LAC, because the Chinese attitude is that LAC today is not necessarily LAC tomorrow. Actual, eh? line of actual control. And what is actual can uh, change from day to day, from week to week, from month to month. And that is what they have been doing. So this time, they have intruded into India's territory. And the only way for us, and I'm sure the military should be doing that, it has been doing it, and that is when they intrude into point at point A, India should resist that at point A and at the same time, equally important, start a counter intrusion at point B previously chosen because along the border there are points which are you know locally advantages to China and there are points which are locally advantages to India. Now, if when we do that, and when there are intrusions and counter intrusions at A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, then China will agree to sit down at the table, diplomatic level or political level, it doesn't matter much. <clears throat> and then we can meaningfully engage on mutual withdrawals. Because otherwise, Consider a thought experiment. China has intruded 10 kilometers into Indian side. And then they say that, okay, we shall withdraw, they shall withdraw two kilometers, and you, India, also should withdraw two kilometers. So, what does it mean? 10 minus 2, they are holding on to the eight kilometers. Now, that is what we have to uh, fight against, and that's what we are doing. I, I have full faith in the Indian military to take care of that. But we have to understand what they are up to. That's very, very important. And also, um, on the 16th of June, the Ministry of External Affairs had put out a statement summarizing the conversation between uh, the two foreign ministers. And there it was clearly stated that uh, it was China which carried out the aggression and that India wants, India demands the restoration of the status quo and they, you know, that is a very important demand. And uh, I personally would like to see that demand repeated. Uh, I have not seen it repeated for a short while. Let's see. Now, let's uh, move on about, you know, the another myth. And that is that uh, Nehru's policy of non-alignment was not uh, in India's interest. If India had joined... Uh, the American camp, America would have uh, helped us in so many ways and India would have become a developed country pretty soon. I want to make a point. You see, that was the time of the Cold War. You see, the problem with history is that, you know, we have to imagine what the past was. Now, that needs a little exercise of mind. Now, the Cold War, even before the Second World War ended. <laughs> American military think tanks had come to the conclusion 
that the Soviet Union was the new enemy. That is, Germany will be defeated soon, but then the Soviet Union will be the enemy, and that is how the Cold War started. Now, what is the best description of the Cold War? Let me give a quotation from Henry Kissinger himself, a high priest of Cold War. The superpowers often behave like two heavily armed blind men feeling their way around a room, each believing himself in mortal peril from the other, whom he assumes to have perfect vision. Each side should know that frequently uncertainty, compromise and incoherence are the essence of policy making. Yet, each tends to ascribe to the other a consistency, foresight and coherence that its own experience belies. Of course, over time, even two armed blind men can do enormous damage to each other, not to speak of the room. End of quotation. The room meant our earth. Now, Jawaharlal Nehru did not want to follow either of the two blind men, and that made sense. And don't forget, India got a lot of assistance, assistance, economic assistance, both from the United States and the West, and also from the Soviet Union. Our first steel, steel plant, for example, came with the Soviet Union's help. Okay, now let's come to our time. What's the big picture? Part of the big picture is that uh, everybody says the United States is on the decline. Yes, it is. It has been on the decline for a while. Let us analyze. Its share in world GDP was 40% in 1960. Probably it was 50% in 1945 46, when Europe was in utter ruin, when Japan was absolutely demolished, and India and other countries were, you know, uh, yet to develop. Then, by, 20, uh, by 1980, it became 20, it came down to 26%, and in 2020, it is 23.6%. However, despite this decline in contribution to GDP, world GDP, the United States remains the greatest power, and no other power is anywhere close to it. China has been rising, but as we know, it has stopped rising peacefully. It is an economic superpower, accounting for 15.5% of the world economy. But we should not make the mistake of saying that GDP alone determines the geopolitical power of a nation. Let us look at the top 10 countries in terms of GDP. United States, China, Japan, Germany, India, UK, France, Italy, Brazil, and Canada. Now, this is the nominal GDP. Eh? <coughs> now, who is missing from the top 10? An important omission is Russia, indeed a great power. Hence, the GDP matters, but it is not the only thing that matters. Take Israel. It ranks at 32, but it's a very active power. Now, there is a Cold War going on between United States and China. Now, I want to make a point about this expression Cold War. It is an absolute misnomer. It was George Orwell who coined it, and it was Walter Lippmann, United States um, journalist, who popularized it. 
And the thought was that, you know, listen, we have had the Second World War, we haven't had uh, a Third World War, and hence it is only a Cold War. Well, it has been a Cold War between United States and the USSR. But there have been many hot wars uh, waged around, uh, elsewhere in the world with these two fighting through proxies and millions have died, millions have died. And there I want to bring to your notice that in 1950, the Korean War started when it was in June, uh, North Korea invaded South Korea. Well, initially the North Koreans were able to sweep down towards the South, but then MacArthur came. And by October, MacArthur was marching up. He had crossed the 38th parallel, the dividing line between the two Koreas. And sometime in October, Chu and Lai, the Prime Minister and Foreign Minister of China, wanted to have a midnight meeting with Sardar K.M. Panikya, the Indian ambassador there. And Chu and Lai told Panikya, to tell Nehru, to tell Truman that unless MacArthur stops, the PLA, People's Liberation Army, would step in. Nehru conveyed it to Truman. Nehru was ridiculed by the New York Times and others as a peacenik who doesn't understand the real world. And Truman also rejected Nehru's warning because MacArthur had told him, based on military intelligence, that he would celebrate Christmas in the liberated city of uh, North Korea's capital. 1950, Christmas. Well, we all know what happened. The PLA entered and the war lasted. And three years later, more than three million deaths later, mainly of Koreans, but including 55,000 Americans. The ceasefire was on the same 38th parallel, slightly adjusted to North Korea's advantage. So tell me, who was the realist, Truman or Nehru? Anyway, that is just to explain what diplomacy can do if everybody agrees. Now, Coming to the Cold War between China and uh, uh, United States, <clears throat> in South China Sea, China has been annexing territories not belonging to it. You know, just because it is called South China Sea, it doesn't mean it belongs to China. Incidentally, historically, it was the Portuguese who gave the name South China Sea. There is the Indian Ocean. But India never claims the Indian Ocean belongs to India. It is a name given, you see. Now, that China has been doing blatantly, brazenly violating the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Seas and intimidating neighbors, Vietnam, the Philippines, Malaysia, and all that. Then, uh, of course, there is a trade war going on between China and the United States, partly triggered by President Trump because he prefers war to peace. And China has a middle kingdom complex. That is, it considers itself the center of the globe and it has the preeminent position. Others are free to come and pay tributes. There is the story of uh, an English uh, uh, envoy who went to China and uh, the emperor said, please thank your king for his respectful tributes. You know, but then he added, don't you dare to come here and establish uh, any, have any establishment for doing trade. I warn you. Well, that was sometime in the 18th century. Later, we know what happened, eh? the Opium War and all that. 
Okay. Now, China is a very historically conscious country, and it knows that, you know, till the 18th century, uh, China had a huge share in the world GDP because at one time, between China and India, the two countries controlled about 59%. Okay. Uh, now, can Xi Jinping, the supreme ruler of China, he is a president, he is the chief of the party, and very, very important, he is the chairman of the military commission. No other leader since Mao had so much of power concentrated in his hands. Now, Xi Jinping is in a hurry to realize China's dream. China's dream of co-equaling the United States and overtaking it as the superpower, the superpower. Now, can China be trusted? Well, India did its utmost to befriend China. Our Prime Minister went and met uh, Xi Jinping more than once, invited him to India more than once, and uh, they had always very cordial conversations. But despite that, China has done what it has done. So we cannot trust China. In fact, as Reagan used to say, trust but verify. So that is where we are as regards China. Now, I personally do not think uh, that there will be a 62 type of war because it will not be in China's interest to start one. But what should we do in case China starts? I have no doubt that we should not hesitate, hesitate at all uh, to seek United States military assistance. What we need is not boots on the ground. What we need is the United States Air Force. And uh, once China knows that we shall do that, China will not start a war. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> do we need uh, a military alliance with the United States to make sure that it will come to our assistance? I do not think so. Let me explain. In international relations, what matters is interest, not friendship or uh, enmity. Okay? Uh, Lord Palmerston, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, 1855 to 1865, with just one year gap, eh? he said in the House of Commons in 1848, and I repeat, therefore I say that it is a narrow policy to suppose that this country or that is to be marked out as the eternal ally or the perpetual enemy of England. We have no eternal allies and we have no perpetual enemies. Our interests are eternal and perpetual. And those interests, it's our duty to follow. Take, you know, uh, Japan and uh, Germany. They fought the Second World War against the United States, but uh, they are allies now. So, that is where we are. Now, diplomacy implies the ability to dance with more than one partner at a time. I am saying this especially in the context of India's relations with Iran. You must have come across recent reports saying that Iran has told India, thank you so much for uh, your uh, offer to help us with that transport corridor from Chabahar to Zahedan in Iran and further to Central Asia, other countries in Central Asia. We, shall, we are going to start it and you are welcome to join it at another time. Same way Iran has told us that uh, uh, the Farzad B gas field, ONGC Videsh has been negotiating for years and years. Well, thank you so much. We are starting it in any way. And maybe you can join it 
another time. Now, why is Iran doing it? That is because Iran was deeply disappointed when India stopped importing oil from Iran, when President Trump, now I'm using plain English, ordered the world stop importing oil from Iran. Now, this is what they call technically sanctions. In fact, these are called secondary sanctions. The primary sanction, sanctions were directed against Iran when Trump uh, decided to walk out uh, of a solemn agreement. And uh, anyone who studies that agreement will know it's a very solid agreement which will prevent Iran from making a nuclear weapon. But Trump wanted to do what he did because as candidate he had promised it. But if we know something. What a candidate promises, it doesn't mean the president has to do it because when you are president, you know more about what is happening in the real world. Only thing is that you will have to explain to your electorate why you are not doing what you promised. Anyway, that is not Trump's style. When he was elected in November 2016, I had written an article, President Donald Trump, Holland, a bull in the China shop with a question mark. And this was published in the Eurasia magazine. And I had then said that we do not know, but there is a high chance that he might turn out to be a bull in the China shop because he might behave like a real estate manager, you know. Anyway, he is on his way out, hopefully. Now, uh, we carried out uh, the first part of the Chabahar project, which was a uh, port project. Incidentally, Chabahar means four springs. The weather there is uh, so wonderful throughout the year. And uh, uh, we delivered that. But uh, part two of that investment uh, in infrastructure and much more, we have not been able to do that, primarily because of United States sanctions. Uh, apart from that, you know, we are not very good in delivering projects abroad. That is uh, another weakness which we have to tackle. So, Iran got disappointed and that is what they did. In my view, India should have stood up to the United States and told President Trump courteously, deferentially, <coughs> diplomatically that Dear President, for India, it is very important to import oil from Iran because many of our refineries are attuned to Iranian oil. You know, Iran, oil has many different qualities, you know, sulfur content and whatnot and whatnot. And Iran uses a long credit. We don't have to pay immediately. So if we stop importing from Iran, it will cost us quite a lot of money. Hundreds of course of repeats. So let us agree on one thing. We are good friends. We value your friendship. We value your leadership. So what we can do is that uh, we can formally ask for a waiver and you can grant it to us. So that's a charade we can go through. But uh, we need to import. And at some point during the conversation, President Trump can be reminded very sort of uh, tactfully that India is one of the largest importers of arms from the United States. This is a Trump card, Trump card, eh? I mean it, because President Trump is the most, has been the most enthusiastic salesperson for the military industrial complex in the United States. He would have got the message. So if we had done that, and if we had continued to import oil from Iran, incidentally, China did it, eh? and America couldn't do anything. So then the course of history would have been different. And uh, But anyway, let's see, because uh, entry to Afghanistan, you know, Pakistan is preventing us from having the land connectivity. Entry to Afghanistan and to, to Central Asia is of 
great importance for us strategically. Let's hope it will work out. Now let's move on. Our neighbors, South Asia. The neighbors are the most important because, uh, you know, your relationship with neighbors determines your uh, Spielraum in German, that is maneuverability. How much of maneuvering space do you have? Now, we have a problem there because, uh, as Chanakya said, uh, you know, <coughs> among the neighbors which a country has, one neighbor will is likely to treat you as a natural enemy. In our case, we have two neighbors which are treating us as a natural enemy, Pakistan and China. Now, the reasons are different. In the case of Pakistan, it is because Pakistan does not have real democracy. It is because in Pakistan, foreign policy decisions are made by the Pakistan army that there is this problem with, with relations with India. Because Pakistan army has correctly concluded that unless they can project that there is an imminent threat from India, they will not be able to control <coughs> Pakistan domestic politics. In fact, I would say Pakistan is an occupied country, occupied by its own army. Now, China, well, China sees that India is the only country that can stand up to China in Asia. You know, other countries are smaller, whereas India has a long past, population-wise and otherwise, India can stand up to China. Not that we want to stand up to China in the sense that uh, uh, we want to stop the rise of China. No, we are neutral about it, so long as it is done peacefully. But uh, China wants, uh, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, they, you know, they have that Middle Kingdom complex, you know. So they think that uh, they should from time to time needle India. In fact, they have no intention of settling the border problem. They will keep it alive as long as possible. So, and there is a deep nexus. Well, my view is that uh, Indian diplomacy can handle it. Uh, we have the means, but uh, it means that uh, very simply, let me put it this way, with uh, both India, uh, both Pakistan and China, we should uh, contain the, the, the discord. We should keep talking and we should never provoke them. And that is very important. But we should stand firm. And if there is any firing from across the uh, line of control from Pakistan, well, that should get a fitting reply. In fact, Balakot and all that, you know, our government did give that befitting reply. But uh, we should keep talking to them. Because when we say that we won't talk to you unless you uh, say that uh, you will no longer... Uh, resort to terrorism. No, that does not make much sense. Because they have said for what it's worth, said that they will not uh, use terrorism. But what is important is you talk. And when you talk, you tell them, look, you know, you have to do this, 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 this for taking the thing forward. So that is that. Now, I just want to say a word about uh, our other set of neighbors. Uh, the GCC countries, where we have more than 8 million of our uh, compatriots there. Now, the GCC countries are going through difficult times, mainly because the price of oil has come down. In fact, it has been calculated that they lost about uh, seven, uh, I'm sorry, $270 billion last year in oil revenue, you know. That's why you must have seen the report about 8 lakhs of Indians coming back from uh, Kuwait. Of course, the report is slightly misleading because uh, this is going to happen, if at all it will happen, over a number of years. And uh, I don't think it will be 8 lakh Indians. It will be much less, but we don't have time to, uh, to, to discuss that uh, another time. So, to go back to foreign policy. 
what do we want to see? Where do we want to see India in 2025 or say 2030? Well, to my mind, I want India to be militarily strong and more self-dependent in terms of military uh, supplies, you know, in terms of technology, in terms of uh, arms and all that. Militarily strong. Not The idea is not to attack any country. No, we don't want to attack any country. We haven't attacked any country. Uh, we intervened in Maldives when Rajiv Gandhi was uh, prime minister. But that was to restore uh, a government which some terrorists had tried to overthrow. That was legitimate. And then, as we all know, Indira Gandhi intervened in East Pakistan. That again was a legitimate purpose. But otherwise, we don't want to attack anyone. But we should be able to give a befitting reply to anyone who dares to attack us. Secondly, I want India to be an economically developed country without poverty. I repeat, without poverty. And I believe it is feasible. Third, it should be a pluralistic, secular uh, uh, society as Gandhi and Nehru envisaged. Now, the Vice Chancellor referred to Dr. G. Ramachandran and also to Dr. Saundaram Ramachandran. Dr. Ramachandran, G. Ramachandran was, uh, of course, disciple of uh, Mahatma Gandhi, but he was also a disciple of Gurudev Tagore. So let me sort of uh, recall the immortal lines of Gurudev Tagore. Where the mind is without fear and the head is held high, where knowledge is free, where the world has not been broken up into fragments by narrow domestic walls, where words come out from the depth of truth, where tireless striving stretches its arms toward perfection, where the clear stream of reason has not lost its way into the dreary desert sand of dead habit, where the mind is led forward by thee into ever widening thought and action, into that heaven of freedom, my father, let my country awake. Now, why did I quote Tagore? in a talk on foreign policy. That is because foreign policy is only a part of state policy. No country can have a, a good foreign policy and a bad domestic policy, nor the other way around. Both the domestic policy and the foreign policy have to be good. Now, I have full faith in the youth of India who are listening to us, I hope, to understand India and to figure out what is good for India, take into account the geopolitical and geoeconomic realities of our times. Uh, I had one more thought, but on which I hope to have another time to talk more in detail, and that is I want to urge you, young scholars, to consider the civil services including the foreign service, as an option, as an option. Well, I'm going to conclude my words by quoting uh, Vivekananda. Awake, arise, and stop not till the goal is reached. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for lending me your ears so graciously. Thank you, Ambassador. It was really insightful. Thank you very much, Ambassador. It was really very insightful uh, lecture for us. Uh, indeed, uh, we are blessed 
to have you in our uh, webinar amidst your uh, busiest schedule uh, of the day. I have, uh, I am not mincing my words, I have no words to thank you. <laughs> Uh, it's a great event uh, that you are with us, sharing very important areas like what has happened in 1962. Uh, the generation must know, uh, which is uh, which is not there at all. Now nowadays people are uh, more into TikToks and so on and so forth, and they are not bothered about what has happened in the past. Uh, like uh, there is a say, nip the bud in the beginning itself. Now we have crossed 70 years of independence. Uh, these are all important things our youths should know at this point in time. And a very learned person like you, a very uh, respected and decorated uh, diplomat like you, explaining, uh, taking your all time and explaining us even the small, small things in integrity. And uh, uh, this was very, very uh, informative, and uh, it it has it, it was a very simple presentation, Ambassador, that anybody can understand the younger generation. Now, uh, our registrar is there. Uh, fortunately, uh, uh, Sir has uh, completely gone through, and uh, may I request uh, our registrar to say a few words. Uh, over to you, Register, sir. Sir, good evening to... Sir, Sarah please take out, your, take out your uh, mask. No, I, I think I'm audible. Yeah, you are yes. now. Thank you very much, sir. Really, it's a, a blessing for us on this day because first I would like to thank our uh, guest. I will say it's a guest to Gandhigram Rural Institute. Ambassador K.B. Fabian, sir, because this is the first ever program being connecting Gandhigram Rural Institute at Dindikal and Gandhigram Rural Institute Center at New Delhi. This is the first program being organized at this juncture. I think it's a blessing day for us, such a senior person having experience and represented India and today the first program on this webinar series that is India's foreign policies option in the changing geopolitical context. Sir, your speech has the rightly delivered for the younger generation of the South India because this institute having its own tradition by your speech i think you have added one more feather to gandhigram rural institute that this institute should come up by by having more such uh, eminent persons like you to come and share their experiences sir our gandhigram rural institute is always having the vision and mission of integrating the rural uh, policies and bringing the rural students to the global scenario. What you have shared is a, a light you have thrown on the history of the foreign uh, policy and as an ambassador you have shared your experience. To my little understanding what knowledge I am having I think it is your autobiography, how you have served. So I think you should mention in your autobiography what you have spoken and I am sure on the end of the autobiography you will add this webinar as Gandhigram Rural Institute and it is the blessings for all of us. So I am joining with our Gandhigram Rural Institute center at New Delhi and all of our uh, teaching, non-teaching and other staff members to express our thanks to you for being our first person on this 
series of webinar being conducted at this crucial point of time so i thank you sir for accepting our invitation and being part of it and i also feeling blessed that instead of giving felicitation expressing thank you is better so i thank god for given me this opportunity to say thanks to you and thanks to everyone being part of this webinar series thank you sir thank you uh, thank you register yes sir thank you sir. thank you register sir uh, this was a wonderful evening that you have come you have uh, been with us and uh, uh, you have uh, you have put your words uh, pouring from heart rather uh, for the sake of speaking uh, thank you sir thank you so much uh, able to uh, hear the question uh, ambassador no no please repeat the question i am yeah. sorry for this yes yeah. no issues no issues uh, there is a surprise element what i have told you smiled and you just uh, the battery has gone down uh, now <laughs> <laughs> our chancellor was going through the entire uh, uh, webinar and uh, uh, he has picked up something from what you said uh, the rural youth in our country uh, they are very much capable and uh, they are bubbling with energy uh, how gandhigram can contribute uh, in terms of bringing civil services to the rural youths uh, civil services uh, uh, thing uh, in, uh, knowledge to the uh, rural youths and there is a writer also uh, he has also requested you to handhold uh, this uh, initiative of gandhigram rural institute in the days to come well thank you it is the battery of my computer that was going down not my <laughs> battery it is still strong especially in your company <laughs> thank you so you much you know when one is with uh, with uh, the youth you know it is very rejuvenating and energizing true now i am honored to receive uh, that uh, proposal from the chancellor and uh, i shall be honored to Uh, work together on that uh, and uh, maybe maybe if you like i can send you a uh, a draft proposal giving out some ideas to like start on it and uh, so that is we shall work on it uh, online but uh, maybe later when uh, offline also we can work True. we will work on it but we we'll start online yeah do uh, the chancellor uh any tips you would like to give uh, how to train our students like uh, undergraduate level they are coming in uh, any initiative okay let me put it this way what is and elsewhere it means go and uh, join this uh, coaching uh, institutes yeah where they pay more than a lakh or 2 lakhs of rupees and they have very long lecture hours and all that but there is a basic flow that is these students you do not read the newspapers you know and they get this digest prepared by the faculty in those coaching institutes and never follow current affairs unless you follow them day to day so my first thought is that our students should read the newspapers okay you know not only the newspapers and also they should listen to the radio say doordarshan and also the bbc you see and second point is that uh, preparing for the civil services doesn't mean burning the midnight oil hmm. no it means one has to do it methodically if they can when they are 18 or 19 start devoting 3 hours a week you know to current affairs and these things which i mentioned mm. then they will be prepared and they should also look up the preliminary papers prelims you know lot of general knowledge why is there uh, uh, no elephant in uh, iceland for example you know they should look up these matters and uh, you can form uh, a group of a team of uh, uh, i mean from your faculty to assist them you see so at some point when they are say 19 uh, they should uh, under examination conditions start answering these prelim papers 
And another thing is that when they are 18, 19, they should figure out what is the main subject they are going to take. And they should choose a subject which they love to read, not as a punishment, not as a preparation for the examination. No, they should choose a subject and they should start reading it, reading it in depth. I'm sure the young people can do it with assistance from your team. So if we do that, I am sure that uh, we would be in and I would also say, this is my last thought for the time being, that, uh, you know, make a survey, send out a questionnaire and find out how many want to join the civil service and ask them to write a small, a sh short, brief essay in 250 words why they want to join the civil service. Okay. Now, eliminate those essays which are not good. Okay, because choice means elimination. Okay, suppose a thousand had, uh, now, well, bring uh, it down to 500. Okay, then go on with this uh, coaching, very informal coaching, which I said, and conduct an, another examination and pare it down to say another 200. You know, so finally have a, te have a, have a team of students who are genuinely, deeply committed to entering the civil service and they can be given the necessary guidance and they will be in. So today I was looking at uh, future cabinet secretaries, future ambassadors, future deputy uh, uh, district magistrates and so much more. Thank you, Ambassador. It was really a pleasant evening to have you and to hear you, uh, uh, we all are very sure, I am very sure that we all, whoever has attended or whoever is going to see it in the YouTube in the days to come, will be enriched with this kind of uh, knowledge and this kind of uh, uh, lectures uh, in the days to come. Uh, I pray to God Almighty that uh, you should be given a very, very good health in the days to come. And uh, let me come down to a formal um, uh, conclusion, uh, Ambassador Fabian, Ambassador K.P. Fabian, you have delivered a very, very informative lecture in foreign policy options in the geopolitical context. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Thank you very much. Jai Hind. Thank you. I have enjoyed every moment. Jai Hind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you.